Thanks very much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to my uh, nominators and supporters. Uh, as I say, a delight to, to be here. My name is Peter. Uh, I'm a roboticist. Uh, that's what I've been doing for a very, very long time. Uh, my formal background is an electrical engineer, and I specialized in control theory. That's where I got started and drifted into robotics. Robots and machine, it needs control. But actually, the more interesting problems in robotics are around how do robots understand the world that they are embedded in. So then I drifted then into computer vision. How does a robot use cameras to understand the world that's around it? Sense of vision is completely natural to us. It's incredibly powerful. We take it for granted, which we shouldn't do. So a lot of my career has been devoted to how do we imbue robots with a sense of vision. It's the most powerful way to understand the world that's around them. I worked for CSIRO for very many years, for 25 years. I started in manufacturing, and in the 1980s, robots was all about manufacturing. That's what robots did. They worked in factories and built stuff. Later on, I got the opportunity to work with robots in many other and more diverse applications, and I'll talk a little bit about those uh, in the next slide. In 2010, I left CSRO and joined academia. And I think having been a, a practitioner to have worked with industry, to have worked on real world problems, I think is a real advantage in moving across to academia. I'm also director of an ARC Center of Excellence for Robotic Vision, which kind of brings together the thing that I've worked on for sort of most of my life. I've now got a, a huge army of really smart people uh, to help me progress that agenda. So, some career highlights. A very young man up in the top left corner. Uh, we were working on embodying robots with a sense of touch. We wanted robots to be able to hold a grinding tool and move metal burrs from uh, pieces of metal that had been forged. And so that was cutting edge material at the time. Computers were rubbish. It was a very, very hard thing to do using the technology of the era. I've mentioned before that I'm interested in visual perception, and my earliest steps in visual perception wasn't in a robotic context, it was in the context of looking at cars and trucks moving along highways. And many of you in New South Wales will have seen signs that say safety cam underneath bridges. I was the chief technical architect for the safety cam system, which looks at cars, or looks at big trucks, figures if they're speeding, takes their license plates and automatically issues tickets if they get between A and B more quickly than they should. Uh, I can tell you a lot about how that works. I moved to Brisbane and had the opportunity to work in the mining industry. We looked at automating massive mining machines, uh, dragline excavators, rope shovels. We worked on self-driving underground vehicles in the late 90s. This is before Google got famous for doing self-driving cars. We were driving these, these machines, uh, load haul dump units that you see here, 20 kilometers an hour through underground tunnels with this much clearance on either side. Uh, there were no people pedestrians or cyclists down there, so the problem is in some ways constrained and easier. Uh, but self-driving vehicles has got a long, long history. Then moved into flying machines. So we started building autonomous flying robots in the late 90s. It's before drones were a thing. Right? Drones, as we know them today, hadn't been invented. We were doing it with helicopters, way harder. But machines that fly in the air are not that different to machines that move through fluid, flying through water. So we took a lot of that technology and put it in underwater robots. I got interested in very early Internet of Things technology. We put sensors on cattle, and we could then monitor what the cattle were doing, what they were doing every hour of the day, walking, sleeping, ruminating. We learned a lot about how cattle behave. We took it a step further and put actuators on those collars so we could control how animals access the landscape, a technique called virtual fencing. So imagine moving animals across the landscape without drovers and without fences. More recently at QT, we've been looking at robotics for agriculture. So uh, a capsicum picking robot and a large scale weeding robot. It can look at, a, look at the ground, look at a plant, classify it, what species is it, and figure out whether it's a good plant or a bad plant and terminate it if need be. So there's some of the uh, career highlights. I want to talk briefly about robotics and AI, and AI has already been nicely introduced. AI is a well-advanced field, and we've made massive progress in things that human beings believe are very hard. Things are hard for people, computers can do very easily. Beat humans at the game of chess, at the game of Go. But things like the image on the right-hand side, that is still beyond the scope of what we can do to, with today's technology. A robot that can recognize a particular chess piece, reach in and pick it up and manipulate in his fingers is beyond current technology. It sounds perverse when you see that robots are gonna make 47% of people's jobs redundant in, 20, in two decades. 
robots are not that yet not yet that advanced. Uh, so this is a, a topic that I feel uh, is really important. There's a lot of concern, there's a lot of anxiety in our society at the moment. There are a lot of great things that autonomous technology can do, robotic technology, for agriculture, for health, for logistics, uh, for replacing the productivity we will lose as our population ages. But there will be stresses in our society from the introduction of this technology. It's a debate, it's an important debate. ATSI have started it, and that's, great. that's fantastic. And there are also a lot of ethical concerns about where's the right places to use autonomous technology and where not to. I think we're uncomfortable with entrusting the upbringing of our children to robots. Uh, elderly care, warfare, these are all things that I think we need to think very deeply about. Because the technology will make it possible. We have to make the conscious decision about whether we allow it. So, thinking about what it is that I can do to, uh, to help ATSI and ATSI can do to help me. I think we've all got agendas that we want to progress. My own, uh, my own centre is doing a national road mapping exercise at the moment, just trying to do an audit of who is playing in this AI, robotics and computer vision space in Australia. Who, who has an interest? Who are the companies? What does it mean for the bottom line of our country in terms of economy, in terms of employment, in terms of environmental outcomes? We don't really know that. So my centre is developing a national roadmap that we hope to have released next May that, at least in the first draft, provides some information that we can use to drive policy. I've become, since I joined the university, uh, very, very engaged in, in, uh, in education. I've done a lot of work in online education. Through my online courses, more than 90,000 students have gone through. And I believe that with technology now, it's possible for us to influence very large numbers of people. So these technologies, my interest in uh, online STEM education, uh, I think this is something that I can perhaps work with ATSI and uh, ways of progressing the, the STEM agenda. So I'm also a, a fellow of the IEEE and a fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. So I also provide bridges between those organisations as well. I'm on the governing board of the IEEE's Robotics and Automation Society, which is having all the same conversations about robot ethics and jobs and so on. So lots of people in the world thinking about it. We need to, we need to unite and come up with a coherent voice. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.